partnership with Cuba is just one of the most exciting things I think that we're doing. That God works through this in incredible ways. Guillermo will send me pictures on Facebook every week of how uh, we're feeding people there and how it's making an impact uh, in the world right there where, where they're serving, how it's bringing people to Jesus. Uh, this May, um, we're having another trip to Cuba. I'll be going and invite you to join me. Uh, you need to have a passport. So if you don't have that, you might as well apply now for the next time we go to Cuba because you won't be able to get it in time this time. It's just the time of passports and visas takes more time than that. But if you've got a passport and want to go, uh, there's info in your bulletin. We'll have an info meeting coming up real soon. Uh, awesome opportunity just to go and see how God is working uh, there at the church in Cuba. So we're continuing our message series this week where we, that's called Bad Advice. Uh, you might remember that we're, the reason we're talking about bad advice is because even though we wouldn't intentionally live out some of these things, the way that we operate, sometimes it shows that we're living under some bad advice. And we've talked about bad advice about a whole different uh, set of things, uh, but today we're talking, as Tyler said, about how to get fired. Now, I know we're all hardworking people here who probably have no experience with that in our church, right? Sure. But... Uh, Maybe a friend of yours has uh, gotten fired before or something like that. In just a moment, I'll ask you to kind of throw out some ideas to me as to how someone might get fired, what's something you could or might not do in order to get fired. Uh, but first, uh, we got a little video clip. It reminded me of my uh, first regular job, which was for a construction company, and uh, lots of ways to get fired uh, in uh, some type of manual labor industry, right? So here's just a few of them. Check this out. Right? <laughs> they say that comedy is tragedy plus time, right? And uh, I guess it's also a lot funnier when it's not your car that got smashed there, right? It's a whole different story. Or when you're not the one, I, I swear I must have worked with that guy at the construction company who was operating the, the bucket there because not only did he knock the guy in the head, he then dumps the bucket's contents on top of him, right? That's, that's even worse. But how would you get fired? Any ideas? What would you do to get fired? Come in late, yep, I heard that. Stay home instead of going to work. What else? Sleep on the job. The, sleep on the job, yes, that's right. Coming from Gary, who works for Stillwater Church, that's right. Uh, thank you, Gary. Uh, Gary is a hard worker. If, if Gary didn't work hard, we wouldn't have chairs set up this morning. So we know Gary's working hard, right? So Because you're sitting down, that's good. Others? Yes, yell at the boss. What else? Ah, three out of five days missed in a week. That doesn't help either, right? Yeah, yell at the boss. We heard last night, argue with the boss, tell the boss they're wrong. There's a whole series of things like that, right? The bosses tend to not like that. Other things? Steal. Yes, that's a, that's a big one. Don't steal from your company. Others? Ah, yes, let the boss know that you know more than he does, right? It, it's okay to know more than the boss, just don't let them know that, right? Keep them thinking they're the smart ones in the room, right? Right? Stillwater staff will agree uh, straight, quite strongly with that one, I'm sure. Others? Ah, play on the computer. Yes, there's so many ways, right? So many ways you can do, uh, so many things you can do to get fired. And we're not going to stay just in that world this morning. We're really talking about work today. And we're talking, you know, because I believe that work is a very, very important part of our lives as Christians. You know, God cares very deeply about your work. He does. And, and sometimes we make this false uh, kind of like dualism where we separate uh, in our minds like spiritual things from not spiritual things. So we say, well, God might care about work that's done by, by like 
uh, missionaries or, or pastors or people who, who serve others or help the poor or something that God, of course, cares about that, but, but God doesn't care so much about other secular work, right? No, not at all. God cares about your work no matter what your job is. In fact, when we're talking about work today, it really expands beyond just paid jobs. Uh, maybe you work at a paid job, and that's great. Uh, maybe your work is uh, staying home taking care of kids or uh, taking care of an elderly relative. Or maybe your work now, maybe you've retired from a regular job, and your work is serving others in lots of different ways. Uh, there's all sorts of ways that we, we consider work. But God cares very deeply about it. We should, too. Statistics tell us that, uh, that many of us will spend a third of our life, a third of our waking hours in life uh, at work. That's a lot of time. Uh, that's a substantial amount of time. And certainly we have seasons in our lives where we spend a lot more than a third of our time uh, doing work. Uh, so we're going to look today at just a few maybe half-truths about work that the world tells us. Well, there's a whole lot of them, but we're just going to look at three of them today. And I think that these three things come in conflict with, with a Christian view of work. And so maybe this will help us get a better view of, of how God looks at work. Uh, the first one of these half-truths, because half-truths are often bad advice, is that we should work for the weekend. Should work for the weekend. You might say, wait a minute, are you telling me that the band Loverboy has been lying to us all this time? <laughs> well, sort of. I mean, yes, a lot of people do work for the weekend. This is true. To work for the weekend means that you really don't like your job you're unhappy in it, you just kind of put up with it, do the time to cash the check and to leave so you can experience real life because surely real life can't happen at work. It's really kind of a tragic view, isn't it? I mean, if you're going to spend a third of your life at work, what a shame to have that feel like a total waste other than to cash a check at the end of the week. You know, Christians sometimes have a misunderstanding in, in their view of work, and they, they, they look back and they say, you know, God created the Garden of Eden, and he created Adam and Eve, and he put them in this beautiful garden, and there was, there was no work, right? They would just spend their days sitting in hammocks, drinking margarita, or margaritas brought by monkeys. You can think I don't talk for a living, right? But they would just chill out all the time. It was just pure entertainment and all this stuff. But that's it's not really actually an accurate view of the Garden of Eden. Did you know that when Adam and Eve were put in the Garden of Eden, before they sinned, they still had work to do. That was part of it. Uh, Genesis 2.15 says that the Lord God placed man in the Garden of Eden to tend and to watch over it. So our first job was gardening or farming, okay? From the beginning, before sin, Adam is there in the garden and he's tending the garden. He's taking care of it. Uh, then uh, it says in verse 19, so the Lord God formed from the ground all the wild animals and all the birds of the sky. He brought them to the man to see what he would call them, and the man chose a name for each one. He gave names to all the livestock and all the birds of the sky and all the wild animals. Okay, we're just talking about Adam so far because in these verses, Eve hasn't been created yet. Okay, so God brings before Adam all the animals, and Adam names them. Now, that in themselves is a job, but it's more significant than just that task. Because you see, in the ancient world, and, and somewhat today, when you name something, it shows that you have authority over it and you have responsibility for it. It's kind of like with our children, right? You, you uh, bring a child into this world, you have the privilege of naming them because you are responsible for them. Uh, it's your job to make sure that they're fed, that they're cared for, that they're on reasonably good behavior, all these kind of things, right? You walk through the store and you see somebody else's kid acting up, throwing a fit. I don't know about you, but I just kind of smile and keep on walking because it's not my kid, right? Not my circus, not my monkeys. I'm good, you know? <laughs> but if it's my kid, I feel very differently about this, right? Because it's my problem. It's my responsibility. So Adam, when he's naming these animals, he's showing the truth that he is responsible for creation. Uh, it says in Genesis 1.28, God blessed them, and he said, Be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and govern it. Root reign over the fish in the sea, the birds in the sky, and all the animals that scurry along the ground. Now, all this stuff happens before the fall of humanity, okay? So we were put in charge of the earth. 
creation care is our job as human beings, okay? God set us here to be the caretakers of this incredible creation that God has given us. That is work. That takes effort. So from the beginning, we were put in charge. We were given authority. We were given responsibility. We were given work to do. So, so the view that, cre- that God created us just to kind of hang out, to relax all the time, that it was a world just purely for our entertainment to kind of sit and watch, is not really accurate. God placed us here to serve and to work. The fall changed things. When, when humanity sinned, it changed things. Genesis uh, chapter 3 tells us about this. And in Genesis 3, uh, Eve has uh, talked with the serpent. Remember, Satan came and tempted Eve, and Adam was right there too. And, and Eve eats the fruit, and she gives it to Adam. And Adam Eve's, eats the fruit, and they sin, and they disobey the one rule that God had given them. So God comes looking for them, and they try to hide, which is almost comical, right? How do you hide from God? And so they're trying to hide, and, and God calls them out and asks them, what, what have you done? What have you done? And, and, of course, then the blame game starts, right? Adam says, well, it was her fault. She ate the fruit first, right? Did you see that, God? She's, she's really the responsible one. And Eve says, oh, no, it's the serpent, right? The serpent tempted me, and then I ate the fruit. And we start pointing fingers and God response, God's response is this, Genesis 3, 17. He says to Adam, Since you have listened to your wife and ate it from the tree whose fruit I commanded you not to eat, the ground is cursed because of you. All of your life you will struggle to scratch a living from it. It will grow thorns and thistles for you, and though you will eat of its grains. By the sweat of your brow will you have food to eat until you return to the ground from which you were made. For you were made from dust, and to dust you'll return. So from the beginning, work is there, but with the fall, work becomes much more cumbersome, difficult. Instead of of man living or humans living in harmony with creation, now we have some opposition because sin has come and it has marred this perfect creation that we have. And so, so work becomes more difficult, more cumbersome, but work from the beginning was still God's idea. It's still a good thing, even though it can be more difficult. Now, listen, I'm not opposed to weekends, Sabbath, that's God's commandment, right? It's not that we shouldn't enjoy weekends and vacations and all that. We absolutely should. God loves it when we enjoy his creation. That's a great thing. But we don't work for the weekend. We don't exist just to have time off. No, God cares about every aspect of your life, including your work. It all matters to him. And so we exist for all of it, the fun, the work, and everything in between. Uh, Solomon, the wisest man who ever lived, said it this way in Ecclesiastes 3. He said, so I saw that there is nothing better for a person than to enjoy their work because that is their lot. You might say, man, how, that's easy for a king to say, right, for Solomon. But in my job, you might say, that's a lot harder. But you know, may, maybe you're right. Maybe you do have a difficult job. But I think that that life is really about 10% what happens to us and 90% how we respond to it. I have seen folks in jobs that are not jobs that that a lot of people would want to have. They may be difficult, cumbersome jobs, but yet they find a lot of joy in it. They find find a lot of of enjoyment in it. Um, Some some of the great uh, Christian writers of all times did some very menial jobs in their day. Uh, Many of the monks would spend most of their time doing very menial work but yet they found joy and purpose in this because they viewed it as God's calling in their life. What if you looked at your job that way? As something that God has given you in this season of life to be a good steward over, to be responsible for. What if you viewed your job in that way? So we don't work for the weekend. Second thing is, a piece of bad advice would be to work for the boss. Okay, work for the boss. But I say, well, wait a minute, time out. The boss is the one who writes the paycheck, or else the boss's boss writes the paycheck or something. If the boss isn't happy, we've got problems, so of course I work for the boss. Well, there is true truth to that. You need to honor your boss. You need to respect them. You need to meet the goals that they set. That's important. But we don't work only for our earthly boss. Listen to what the Bible says. Colossians 3.23, work willingly at whatever you do, as though you were working for the Lord rather than for people. What if you approached your job that way? Uh, The verse, uh, another translation says, whatever you do, do it with your whole heart, working as to the Lord 
and not unto people. What if you looked at your job as something that you did for Jesus Christ, not just for that boss? Because you know he's watching. He sees what we do. He sees when we work hard. He sees when we slack off. He sees everything in the middle. And, and, and Jesus cares. The Bible tells us that we should work at our job as if we were working for God, not for people. How would it look different if you did that? I mean, if you think about it on a very basic level, let's say that uh, you, you were hanging around here this afternoon for some reason. I was here too, and uh, uh, Gary had diligently picked up all the chairs, and this room needed to be swept, right? And I asked you, I said, hey, would you be willing to just, you know, grab a vacuum and sweep this room for us? My guess is you'd probably do it. You'd probably do a decent job of it, you know, I mean, because you're a kind, hardworking person, right? That's probably how it would work. But what if, same scenario, chairs are cleared, you're here in this room, I'm not here, and all of a sudden, those back doors open, and a ray of light shines through, and some angels start playing some chords on a harp, and in walks Jesus Christ. And he says, hey, I noticed this carpet needs sweeping. Would, could you grab a sweeper and clean that up for us? I'm just going to speculate you would do a better job than you would do for Pastor John, right? I'm going to guess you'd have a higher level of motivation because you're like, I don't know why Jesus needs the floor swept, but he chose me, so I'm going to do a really good job. I would bet it will be the best floor sweeping you will ever give or that this floor has ever had, right? Because if Jesus is here, we don't want to let him down. But you know, that's what the Bible's saying. It says, whatever you do, do it with your whole heart, working for the Lord, not for people. So when you're fixing the car, when you're driving the bus, when you're working behind the desk, when you're teaching people at school, when, when you're cleaning the house, uh, when, when you're building the next bridge, when you're designing something, when you're managing others, all of that, do it for the Lord, not for people. I, you know what? You may, you may not like the boss. You may have an awful boss, okay? <laughs> at the end of the day, though, that's not a cop-out because your real boss is Jesus Christ. He's the one you're serving, and he cares. And the way that you work matters. It really, it's an act of worship to God when you think about it. It really is. All of our lives are acts of worship to God. Nowhere in the Bible does it say, God cares about what you do for an hour on Sunday morning, and the rest, eh, that is not such a big deal. When you live your life out there, it's an act of worship to God. Whatever you do, work at it with your whole heart, working for the Lord, not for people. So that means when we work, we want to give everything every time. We want to give our best. We want to do the best that we can because we're working to serve Jesus Christ. Because we don't just work for a boss, we work for Jesus. You know, Christians should have a reputation. We should have a reputation as being the people that you want to hire. We should be known as the best workers because we should have a motivation that's bigger than, than someone who's not a Christian. Because the person who's not a Christian may be a good person and a hard worker, but at the end of the day, they're working for a person, for a paycheck, or for a passion, something like that. Those are all fine things, but we've got something much, much bigger. We're working to please Jesus Christ. We should have that reputation. You know, I don't know about you, but, but when I'm driving, sometimes uh, driving through the country, and I'll see a scene like this barn here, and, and uh, when you see, I think we got a picture of this, there we go, you see the, the Amish folks building a barn, right? I don't know about you, but whenever I see that, I think, man, there is a group of hardworking people right there. I mean, do you notice not a single one of them is texting right now, right? <laughs> I know they don't have phones, but come on, you know, give them a break, right? They're not slacking off on the job, right? They're working hard. We know them as hard workers. We know them as the people who can build a barn in one single day. And even though you got tons of people out there, everybody's doing something there. Everybody's got a task there. And I think, I think it's because they understand verse like this. Whatever you do, do it with your whole heart, working for the Lord, not for people. So we don't work for the weekend. We don't just work for the boss. The third myth that the world wants us to believe is that we should work to retire. We should work to retire. And don't misunderstand, I'm not saying that it's bad to save for retirement. It's actually a really good thing. Need to be doing that. I'm not saying that it's wrong to retire. I heard a pastor actually preach on that. He said, the word retirement is not in the Bible, so you should never retire. 
Like, well, that, that is accurate. It's not in the Bible, but neither is, I don't know, uh, central air conditioning, Labrador retrievers, Mountain Dew. I'm a big fan of all of the above, right? <laughs> Just because it's not in the Bible doesn't mean that it's not something that's okay to do. If you're retired, if you have worked hard and you've saved and you're able to do that, way to go. Thanks be to God. That's a great thing. You now have an opportunity and a responsibility in how you use your time. God has given you a gift now, uh, the gift that has been earned by your hard work as well, and you have the opportunity to use your time to serve others in a way that, that, that maybe you couldn't back in the working day world. Uh, you have an opportunity to do that. Uh, a friend of mine here at Stillwater always says, don't retire from something, retire to something. I like that. I like that. Retirement does not mean just getting away from a job. I was talking the other night with a friend. His dad is at the age now where he can retire. He's worked really hard. He's saved a lot. He's financially able to retire. Uh, it's, in fact, his company actually kind of needs him to retire because of payroll issues and all this stuff. And yet, he's clinging on. He doesn't want to retire. And do you know why? It's because he hasn't figured out a purpose for his life beyond his job. His whole life, his, his focus has clearly been, has only been on that paycheck and on the things he does at work. And he's got to find now a purpose beyond that. Friends, our life doesn't exist just to, to work or just to get away from work. It exists to serve God. That's why we're here. That's why we're working. So whether you're retired or whether you're not retired, God cares about what you do with your time. God cares about the way that you live. Your life matters to God. I really believe that if God has called you uh, to, to do any job, whatever your job is, if your job is to, to clean a building, right, I believe that the way you do your job matters just as much to God as the way that I do my job. Absolutely. We have different callings, and that's fine, but mine is no more special than yours because this is what God has called you to. This is what God has called me to, and we're both judged by the standard of are we giving our best are we doing excellent work, working for the Lord, not for people? I heard somebody say that, uh, that Jesus never worked, which is really ridiculous, right? Because, well, Christian tradition tells us he was a carpenter the first 30 years of his life. But, but if you think about what Jesus got in trouble for here on this earth, it was all about work, right? The religious leaders uh, gave him grief about the Sabbath, right? Working on John 5, 16, the Jewish leaders began harassing Jesus for breaking the Sabbath rules. But Jesus replied, my father is always working, and so am I. He was saying, you never take a break from doing good. You need to take a break from doing your day in, day out job, but you never take a break from doing good. Jesus also said, uh, one time, the disciples were giving him grief because he was working so hard, he hadn't break, he had taken a break to eat. And Jesus says this in John 4, 34, my nourishment comes from doing the will of God who sent me and from finishing his work. So Jesus worked so hard, he even worked through lunch sometimes, right? He's a hardworking guy. And it doesn't mean we should be work addicts or something like that. That's not healthy either. But clearly, uh, we're, called, we're called to do work. Uh, you know, you are so much more than a paycheck. You are. So your purpose does not end when you stop earning a paycheck. If one of the biggest lies that our society tells folks is that, that retired folks aren't really needed anymore, that you've accomplished your purpose, you've contributed to society, and now just you can just sit at home and, and watch TV and do whatever. What a tragedy. Now I can tell you as a pastor that, that, that so many of the wonderful things that happen here at this church happen because of our retirees. They're phenomenal. They serve in so many ways, taking care, whether it's taking care of our building, whether it's teaching class, or whether it's, you name it. It's so many different things. Maybe you're retired, maybe you're not. But maybe you're sitting here today and saying, you know, I think God's calling me to do something more than what I'm doing. I think God's calling me for a meaning and a purpose that's more substantial than just what I'm investing my time in. Now, uh, you might stop at our, our Connection Center on the way out. We've got a great servant opportunity guide. It tells you all sorts of ways you can get involved here at Stillwater and serve in ways that, that fit you well, 
and, and that allow you to be used by God uh, to build his kingdom, to do incredible things. You know, I heard a story, maybe you've heard it before, a story about a, a guy who visited a job site, and there were three bricklayers who were working, and the guy went up to the first bricklayer, and he said, hey, w- what are you doing, right? It's kind of one of those, uh, here's your sign moments, right? You know, like, I'm laying bricks, right? You know, what's, <laughs> what's wrong with you? Obviously, I'm laying bricks, right? So he moves on to the next guy. He says, well, what are you doing? And the guy says, I'm building a wall. See, he understood that he wasn't just laying bricks, but he was building something more significant. He and the other guys were working together to make this this wall here. He goes to the third brick layer, and he says, what are you doing? And he says, I'm building a cathedral where people will come, and they'll worship God, and their lives will be changed. You know, the first guy had, had a job, right? The second guy, he had a career, but the third guy has a calling. Every single one of us, God has a calling in our lives. You're not just laying bricks. Whatever it is you spend your time doing, it's not just laying bricks. God wants to be building cathedrals through your work. God wants to be blessing this world through your work. What you do matters to God. Would you pray with me? God, thank you for giving us the ability to work. Thank you for calling us to work for you. God, I pray that you would help us to refine the way that we view our work that we would see it as, so, as an act of worship to you, that when we clock in this week, that we would see ourselves as worshiping you, as reporting to you, as doing our best for you. I pray that we would be a great example at our workplace. God, I pray that you would be drawing people to yourself by the way that people from Stillwater Church work. I pray that when people encounter us, that they would, they would want to know more about you because they see a commitment uh, to, to our jobs and a commitment to treating each other with love and with respect. Lord, we thank you for the incredible gifts that you give us, including work. But most of all, God, we thank you for the gift.